Welcome back, everybody. This is uh, Mr. Conway again with Cody Middle School. Today, we got a fun little project planned. I'm going to show you how to design a, in a 3D kind of way a whistle. And if you're in my class, we're going to actually end up printing these things on one of our 3D printers. Uh, if you're not in my class, feel free to follow along. Uh, it's still a really great little introduction uh, to using uh, Autodesk uh, Fusion 360. Uh, you'll end up with a whistle. It hopefully, will work uh, and maybe annoy everybody that uh, you know within a 10-foot radius or more even. Uh, before I really get into this, though, I'm going to give credit where credit is due. This design is based on the tutorial of Lars Christensen. I will provide a link to the video where he shows you how to create a whistle. It's the one that I inspired this uh, in the description of this video. I'll also put a link to his YouTube channel. If you're interested in becoming really adept with Fusion 360, you should go and check out his channel. Uh, he has so many great videos, and he really gears what he does to uh, people who want to get in and get their hands dirty and, and get good with this thing. Uh, and it doesn't really matter your background. He will show you. He has great, uh, I believe, every Wednesday night live streams where he completes builds, uh, answers questions, Really great guy, really great uh, YouTube channel to watch and follow. I can't recommend it enough. Also in the description of this video, you will find this document. And this document is just kind of a summary of what we're doing here. You could think of it as the instructions for uh, creating this whistle. So you can just uh, follow along with this document. Some of you might even find that uh, you don't need to watch the video anymore, that you, you know the tools well enough that you can just read this uh, document and go and just follow this written document. Some of you might find as well that maybe the video wasn't uh, as clear as it should be. You can uh, jump over into this written document and uh, get some extra clarification, uh, more clarity from this document. That will be a, a link in the description as well. All right, well, let's just go ahead and jump into creating our whistle then. We're going to follow this kind of one step at a time, uh, just so we can see well, everything that we're doing. So step number one says, click the grid and snaps menu from the bottom of the screen. Make sure layout grid, layout grid lock, and snap grid are turned off. Let me show you where grid and snaps is. It's down here. And if I click on that, as the instructions say, I want to make sure that these top three things are turned off. You could see that I don't uh, have a check mark next to any one of these three. It looks kind of like layout grid lock has a check mark next to it, but if you notice, it is grayed out. That means it's not even uh, anything to worry about. Once I turn out off layout grid, I can't even select or deselect this one. It just turns off by itself. So. We'll just go ahead and click out of there and look at step two. Step two says right click on the view cube. Make sure the view is set to perspective with ortho faces. So let's look at the view cube. That's this thing in the upper right. And this is the thing that uh, when I have a design here will kind of let me look at the design from different angles. Uh, or different perspectives. And you can see I can click edges or corners uh, or faces of this cube. And if I click a face, then these rotator arrows even come up and I can kind of rotate my view around that way. So if I, let me just click a kind of a corner here, or maybe an edge. I'll click back to home. If I ever get in a strange view I don't like, I can click the home view button. It takes me right here. So a cube is all 90 degree angles, but if I look at this angle right here in the corner, it looks like it's not 90. It looks like it's less than 90, and that's because we're looking at it from a perspective. Uh, anytime I try to represent the three-dimensional world on a two-dimensional screen like we're doing, we kind of have to uh, fudge around with the angles a little bit. So we know this is a 90 degree angle, even though it doesn't look like a 90 degree angle. What we're going to do right now is right click on this view cube and make sure that perspective with ortho faces is turned on. Ortho, uh, orthographic view means that all the 90 degree angles will appear as 90 degree angles, no matter what your perspective. So what we just did is we said whenever we're in a perspective view, when we're kind of looking at things at an angle, 
then our, our design will have that perspective view. But if I ever click one of the faces, like this right face or the top face, then if I'm looking at it from a face view, then the orthography will be preserved. That means all the right angles, all the angles will look exactly as they should. They won't be um, messed up because of perspective. It's really helpful, uh, especially when you're trying to get uh, lines behind each other to snap. And we'll actually see an example of that today. So it's a great, it's a great idea just to have that um, perspective with ortho faces uh, turned on. Uh, the next one says that step three says click on your user icon, click preferences, click design, make sure auto project edges on reference and auto project geometry on active sketch plane are both turned on. So your user icon is this one in the upper right hand corner. It probably looks like your initials unless you've changed your avatar on the Autodesk website, but I'm going to right click on that. I'm going to click on preferences might take it a second or two to load. I'll get down in here to, into design and I'm going to ensure that those two things are turned on. That's auto project edges on reference and I've already turned mine on and auto project geometry on active sketch plane. Again, mine is all already turned on. If you had to change anything, what you're going to do now is click apply and after you do that, then you're going to click OK. All right. And let's go ahead and look at step number four. It says create a sketch on the XZ plane. Well, the first thing I'm going to do just to show you how to do that is uh, I always encourage uh, you to turn on the origin. So there's this folder over here in the design browser. That's this area over here on the left. And it's called origin. You can see there's a little eyeball icon next to it right now that's grayed out. If I click on that, well, it turns it on or it turns the view of it on. And I'm actually going to hit this little uh, drop down uh, arrow next to the folder and it will show me everything that's inside of that folder. There are seven things and those things are the origin and that's the spot where all the axes meet. You can see I have a green axis, a red axis and a blue axis. And it has uh, these X, Y and Z. So X, Y, and Z are going to be these three axes. If I look over here at my view cube, they're already labeled up there. You can see that the green axis is the Y axis, and I'll test that out. I'll try to turn off the Y axis over here, and you should see the green axis turn off. Now, when I put my mouse over the Y axis here, it turns blue just to show that it's, it's the active axis. So I could turn that on and off. I could turn any of these things on and off. I could told, turn the whole folder on and off. Uh, using the little eyeballs next to all the features. So we have the X, the Y, and the Z axis. Now, the spot where they all meet is called the origin, but the space between two of the axes makes a flat area called a plane. You can see that we have three planes, and the way that we name them is just by the letters on the axis. So this one right here between the green uh, Y axis and the blue Z axis would be the YZ plane. And you can see as I put my mouse over the plane, over there on the left in the origin, right, it becomes highlighted in blue. Uh, and the opposite is true. If I uh, put my mouse over the YZ one over here in the browser, that it kind of highlights the one over there in the, the workspace. So our instructions want us to create a sketch on the XZ plane. So uh, there's a several ways to do that. Creating a sketch is always right here. There's a button for it just right at the top or under the create menu, you can see create a sketch. They do the same thing. It doesn't matter which one you use. I'll just click this one right here. And it wants me to place it on the X, Z plane. I can do that just by looking at my view cube and thinking, okay, so there's X is red and Z is blue. So that's the one between blue and red. It would be that plane right here. Or this is my preferred method. I know I want it on the XZ plane, so I'm just going to go over here to my origin folder and click on the XZ plane. However you choose to do it is A-OK. -okay. So I'll click it. And you can see it brings me from uh, a face or face orthographic view on my view cube from the top down to XZ. So you can see the X is uh, this axis going side to side. And now the Z axis is actually this green one going up and down. Uh, I, I know it's the Z axis though, because right here in the origin view, I can still see it's the blue Z one. 
All right, let's go on to our next step, which is step five. And that says, add a center point circle to the sketch. Place the center of the circle on the sketch's origin. So the center point a circle is uh, a couple ways to get there. So number one, it's right up here uh, in kind of the menu. I can also go into the create menu and go to circle and choose, uh, oh, that's center diameter circle. I mislabeled it on the instructions. I'm sorry about that. So whenever in the instructions call for center point circle, it really means center diameter circle. Or you could see there's the letter C next to it right here. That means there's a keyboard shortcut for it. And that's the letter C on your keyboard. That's what I prefer to use. So I'll hit the letter C. And you could see that it brings open the circle tool. My, I can tell because my mouse cursor has changed. Uh, let me just go ahead and hit the escape key on my keyboard and that will exit the circle tool. So anytime I'm in a tool and I want to get out of that tool, I can just hit escape on my keyboard as I'm doing right now. But I'm hit the C key on my keyboard, start that center diameter circle. And the instructions tell us to place it uh, on or start it on the origin. That's this point where the axes meet. So if I pay real close attention to my cursor, I can see that it is a black cross. But as I put it over the origin, my black cross turns to a blue square. That blue square uh, tells me that it's going to snap or stick to that point. So anytime I see that blue square and I'm kind of near a point, that means whatever I'm doing is going to stick or snap to that point. So I'm going to start my circle right here. I'm going to click once and then I'm going to drag with my mouse or my trackpad out. And you can see that it's starting to make a circle. I'm going to click anywhere for right now. Uh, and it creates this circle. I'm going to look at my next uh, step, and that is dimension the circle to have a diameter of 25 millimeters. So if you remember from math class, diameter is the measurement from one side of the circle to the other side of the circle right through the middle. Uh, I can change the dimension of anything by using the dimension tool. That means I can change the size or the angle of things. I can get to the dimension tool in a couple of different places. Oh, it looks like I have my circle uh, tool open right now. I'm going to hit escape to get out of that. So the dimension tool is either right up here in the menu bar. And if I hover my mouse over it, it tells me what it does. It also says the letter D next to it. So I hope you guessed. That means that I could hit the D key on my keyboard to open the dimension tool. So I'll hit D and you can see it opens the dimension tool. I need to resize my circle, so I will just click on my circle right here, and you can see it draws a uh, sorry a diameter across the circle, and you can put it anywhere. That's just kind of like a label that's going to tell you what the dimension you typed in for it is. So I'll just put that here, and my instructions call for a 25 millimeter uh, di diameter circle, so I'm just going to type in the number 25, and I'll hit enter on my keyboard or return, and you can see that it resizes my circle. Now my circle's kind of small now. I want to get that, make that a little bit bigger. I can either, if you have a mouse with a center wheel, you can use the center wheel to zoom in. You can use the, the pinch method uh, if you're on a trackpad, just like you do uh, on a phone. Or you can use some of the stuff down here. I really like this one right down here is this fit view. What fit view does is it uh, and you'll see there's a, a little drop down next to it. I can choose zoom window or fit. Zoom window lets me draw a box and it zooms to that box, but fit uh, takes whatever design I have so far and fits it perfectly to my screen. I use this all the time. So I'm gonna fit uh, to there and you can see it zooms in just perfectly. Now, let's say I didn't want that dimension of 25. I made a mistake. I can always undo a mistake in a couple ways. I can either hit the undo um, button right up here and that undoes the last thing you did or on my keyboard I can hit Control Z if you're on a, a PC or Chromebook or Command Z if you're on a Mac and and you can see that uh, takes away my dimensions and I did that because there is something I want to show you about my circle here I'm just gonna click on a, this dimension I don't like that dimension I can click on it and I can hit the delete key on my keyboard and it goes away Right now, the edge of my circle is a blue line. 
Blue lines in uh, Fusion 360 basically means things are kind of free. Uh, and you can see this the circle is free to change its size. We did start it on the center point, so it's not free to leave that center point, but it is free to change its diameter. Uh, but when I hit the D key and I dimension this thing to 25, you can see that it goes from blue to black. That means my circle is no longer free. So the point of Fusion 360 is to create solid objects. So we like black lines because those are solidly in place. They can't change. If I click on this now, I can't do anything with that line. It's stuck there. It is stuck to the center and it's stuck with a diameter. There's nothing I can do to that circle. So when it turns black, that means it's stuck. It's anchored. We like that. And I'm going to return to the fit view of that. All right. So that's kind of one of our goals today is all of our lines should turn black in this sketch. The uh, next step says create a line. I can create a line uh, up here. There's the line tool just from the menu bar. I can go into the create menu and I can choose line there. You can see that there is a keyboard shortcut next to it. It's the letter L. I'm not really trying to confuse this here, I guess. I'll uh, just hit L and I will create a line. So a line is created with two points. I'll click once. And for this line, I'm going to kind of want to keep it uh, just straight side to side, not perfect. Uh, and you can see after I click the second point, it still wants to continue on and make another line. I can get out of that by hitting escape. And then I just have my line. So let's look at what the next thing tells me. It tells me to dimension the line to 35 millimeters. Well, we've talked about dimension before, so I'm just going to hit D on my keyboard. I'm going to click on my line and you can see it brings up the label. Now be very careful. See how the label bar is going side to side? That means whatever dimension I give it will go from those straight up and down or you could even uh, lines on the grid. I don't want to do that. I, I want it to be the length of the line. So my label bar should follow or be parallel to the line that I created. So this is not good for the line that we want. This is good. So I'm just going to click off here a little bit. And it said it wanted a line of what, 20, 35. So we're going to have to dimension that line to 35. So I'll type in the number 35 and I'll hit enter. And again, it's way off my screen. So I'm going to hit the uh, fit button. It fits everything to my screen. The next step says to add a horizontal constraint to the line. So Let's talk about constraints. That's all these things up here. You can see the ones in red are constraints. There's even a constraint toolbar. What a constraint does is it's basically like a rule that this uh, shape has to follow. So we're going to give this guy a horizontal constraint. That means we're telling this line it must be horizontal. It can't be anything else but horizontal. So the horizontal constraint can be found in a few ways. It's uh, up here in the menu bar. It's also in this menu, the horizontal vertical constraint. Uh, since this line is more horizontal than it is vertical, it will snap to horizontal when I apply that constraint. Or I can right click on the line and oh, oh of course it's not gonna it's not gonna be there for this one. Okay. So I'm just gonna click off of that. Uh, oh it's because I have the dimension tool still open. I'll escape out of the dimension tool. And now I'll right click on my line. Oh, and there it is. You can see that there is a horizontal vertical constraint. Uh, so I'll apply it just like that. So my line goes completely horizontal. And I know it's horizontal because right here is the horizontal constraint symbol. So that is telling me that there's been a rule or a constraint applied to this line. Let's look at the next step. That says snap the left end point of the line to the circle's edge with the coincident constraint. Again, so I have this point, it's this, this instruction is saying this point needs to live on the, the very edge of the circle or the line of the circle. So we can use this coincident uh, constraint tool right here. Again, it's uh, just up in the menu bar or just the menu itself. I'll select the coincident. And in order to do this, I'm going to say, I'm gonna click on this end point and I'm going to say, hey, endpoint, you need to live on this circle. So I'll click the circle's edge and boom, 
I'm going to escape out of my coincident. And my line is still blue, even though it's horizontal and even though it is snapped on uh, to the circle's edge because I'm still free to move it around like that. All right? You can see there's lots of places around the edge of the circle that the end of that line can decide to live. So what we need to do is we need to lock it to a place on the circle. And the place that we're going to lock it is at the very top. So we're going to get our, our line kind of close to the top like mine is now. Uh, in, for the next step, which was number 11. So make sure the line is in the upper half of the circle by clicking and dragging it along the circle's edge. You just saw me do that. Uh, number 12 says, use a tangent constraint between the line and the circle to make the line snap to the very top of the circle. Tangent means that this line can only touches this circle in one spot. So imagine, follow my cursor here, if my line just keeps going out. You can see it's going to touch the circle in a couple different places. It's going to touch it right here at this edge, and then it's going to shoot out over at this edge. So that is not tangent because it would, if I continued the line, would touch it in two different places. We can force it to touch the circle in only one place, and we've already forced it to be horizontal. So there's only two places on the circle that a tangent line could touch. Uh, or a tangent horizontal line, and that's the very top of the circle or the very bottom of the circle. Since my line is already kind of close to the top, it's going to snap automatically to the top. So our tangent tool is just right up here. So I'll click the tangent tool, and I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to click my line, and I'm going to say, line, you need to be tangent. Oh, make sure my line is selected. Line, you need to be tangent to this circle. So I'll click on the edge of the circle, if it lets me having a hard time there there we go and now my line is tangent to the circle i know it's tangent because i can see the tangency symbol right there and observe now my line turned from blue to black that means that this line is absolutely locked in place it has to be horizontal it has to be 35 millimeters long and it has to be tangent there's nothing else i could do to this line if i tried to do apply another constraint, it might yell at me because it is locked into place. And so any constraint would basically be a new rule that might break one of the old rules. So uh, we are good to go with that line. Uh, step 13 says add another line. Let's go ahead and do that. I'll go line. And this time I'm going to make mine kind of up and down or vertical. And I just need one line, so I'm going to escape out of it. I don't need two lines. Step 14 says, dimension the line to 5 millimeters. So I'll hit D on my keyboard. I'll click on my line. Oh, that's the, that's the wrong dimension. I want it to kind of be parallel to my line. There we go. So I'll type in 5. It is 5 millimeters long now. And... Step 15 says add a vertical constraint to the line. So I'll go up here. I'll escape out of my dimension tool. I'll right click on my line and I'll add the horizontal vertical constraint. And you can see because that line was more vertical than it was horizontal, it automatically became completely vertical. And then the next one says, snap the top endpoint to the line directly to the right endpoint of the line from step seven using a coincident constraint. So here's the line from step seven. So this is saying, I want this top point to snap to this right point. Okay, I'm going to escape out of my constraint tool and I'm going to select my coincident tool and I'm gonna say, hey, Mr. Endpoint, I'm gonna click on it you need to live right on top of this endpoint. So I'm gonna click there and it's a coincident. And this line is also black. There's nothing more I can do with it. I've made it completely vertical. It can't go up and down. I've made it live on that spot and I've made it five millimeters long. That There's nothing more I can do with that line. That line is good to go. Let's read the next step. The next step says add another line. So again, that's L on my keyboard. And I'm just going to kind of make this one more horizontal than vertical. Again, it doesn't matter the size. I'm going to escape out of it. Uh, 18 says dimension the line to 15 millimeters. So D on my keyboard. Click my line. Make sure that it's parallel. There you go. 
Oh, come on, you could do it. And type in 15. It's 15 millimeters long. Add a horizontal constraint to the line. That's step 19. Okay, so I'll, I'll go right click on my line. Oh, I'm still in my dimension tool. Escape out of that. Right click on my line. Horizontal vertical. Boom. There's my horizontal constraint marker. Good. And then step 20, snap the right endpoint of the line to the bottom endpoint of the line from step 13 using a coincident constraint. So it's basically saying this right endpoint has to be coincident with that bottom endpoint. So I'll use my coincident tool. I really like the coincident tool. It lines things up really nice. Uh, snap them together like so, and boom, now that line is black because it's coincident right there. It has to live right there. And it is also horizontal, so I can't change its angle or anything. So good, 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 good. That one's ready to go. I'll escape out of my constraint tool. 21 wants us to, oh, 21 is kind of a longer one. It says, add a three-point arc to the sketch. Click the left endpoint of the line from step 17 to start the arc. Click a second time on the circle's edge to snap the arc to the circle. And use the cursor to bow the arc toward the top and click to lock the bow into place. So let me show you what this looks like. I'm going to go to Create. I'm going to go down to Arc. And you can see there's three different arcs I can choose from. Our instructions want us to use a three-point arc. I'll select that one. Now, you would expect the three points that I draw are kind of beginning, middle, and end. It's a little bit different from this one, and we'll see that it's in a second, but it goes end, end, and then middle. So the first end, it said, is to place it on the left end point of that line. So again, I'm paying attention to my cursor and waiting until I see the blue snap box, and it snaps to that point. Good. And then I'll just come over here and wait, watch my cursor and watch it turn blue. When it turns into that blue X, that means it's going to snap to the circle. And I can just click anywhere there. And then the third place I need to click is just I'm going to bow that uh, up somewhere. So it's right there. I bowed it up right there. Okay, I'm going to click right there. It doesn't really matter where. You can see it created that arc with the beginning here the end over here, and then the middle is uh, somewhere over there. Now, this point, it also creates this point in the sketch. That point right there is the midpoint of the circle. So, uh, just uh, that's something you can resize. If you ever resize this arc, it would basically change the radius of the arc to the midpoint of that circle. Okay. All right, moving on then. So, number 22 says, apply a tangency constraint between the arc and the line it is attached to. All right, so tangency, again, would make that line touch this arc in exactly one spot. So I'll click my tangent tool. I will click the line, and that line should be tangent to the arc like that. And boom, kind of flattens out my arc a little bit there. And it moved the center point of the arc's circle. And I know that this arc is tangent to this line because there is my tangency line. You can see my tangency tool is still open. That's going to be helpful because the next step, step 23 says, apply a tangency constraint between the arc and the circle it's attached to. So I'm going to click on the arc with, and notice my tangency tool is still turned on. So I'm going to click on my arc and then I'm going to click on my circle. And boom, that arc becomes tangent to that circle. And the arc itself becomes black. There's nothing else it can do because it is locked into place. It's anchored on both ends. So it is good to go. And the next one says, click finish sketch. That's the outline of the whistle. So let me zoom fit this. I'll click finish sketch. And there we go. We have the outline of the whistle kind of drawn there. Uh, yeah, looking like it's going to be a good whistle. All right, so we obviously have a two-dimensional object. We need to change our two-dimensional object into a three-dimensional object. And that's kind of what's going to happen next in these instructions. So step 25 says, use the extrude tool to extrude the two profiles of the outline. Set the direction to symmetric. Set the measurement to whole length. Set the distance to 20 millimeters. 
make sure new the new body operation is selected and click OK. So extrude is this tool right up here. It's also under create. Notice we are now in the solid workspace. So we're creating solids. So that's why it says create right here. We're going to create a solid. And all solids are created from uh, two-dimensional sketches in Fusion 360. So I'm going to create an extrude. Uh, I'll just click the extrude tool. Now it wants me to select a profile. So as the instruction said, it wants me to select the two profiles from the outline. To do that, I just click on, we can click on the circle one, and then we can click on the blower part is what I'll call it, I guess. I don't know its technical name. Uh, and then it brings up this arrow. I can click and drag on that arrow and you can see it kind of resizes stuff. I'm not gonna use that arrow for right now. I always like to type in numbers so I get things just right. Uh, it's uh, a couple other things our directions tell us we need to set. It says we need to set the direction from one side to symmetric. You can see that brings open two arrows. Symmetric means whatever I do to one side of the profile, it does to the other side. So you can see, right, it's like pulling it out of one side and pulling it out of the other side at the exact same time in the exact same amount. It also tells me I need to set the measurement uh, from half length to whole length. So I'll do that. So basically before, if it's set at eight millimeters, that means there's eight millimeters from the profile to the edge of the 3D shape. If I set whole length, that means from the edge of the 3D shape to the other edge of the 3D shape is eight millimeters. And it says I need to uh, set the distance to 20. So I'll just go ahead and delete eight right here. I could ooh, also do it down there. I'm sorry. So I'll type in 20 there. And this is looking a little small. So I'll, I'll use my zoom fit right there. And I need to make sure that I have new body selected, and I do. So when all those things are in place, I will click OK. And then voila, I have a solid whistle. Although right now it's just a solid block. It's not hollow inside yet. So that's kind of where we're headed next, folks. All right, number 26 says to use the shell tool to hollow out the whistle. Select the small rectangular end of the whistle that is blown into as the shell face. Make sure tangent uh, target chain is turned on. Uh, set the inside thickness, that's the wall thickness, to 1.5 millimeters. Make sure the direction is set to inside and click OK. So let me show you how it's going to work. Our, our shell command, that's this one right here. It's, on, it's a modify because we're going to modify this solid 3D object. I can click on it there or I can go into the modify menu itself and click shell. Uh, and the instructions say to sh uh, select the small rectangular end that you blow into. And that's right there. So I'm going to select that. Our tangent chain is turned on. And we want our walls to be, and I'm just going to go back to the instructions to make sure I got this right, 1.5 millimeters thick. So I, I just set that right here. I can either use this little arrow, but it only goes in increments of 1 millimeter. Uh, I'll just type in right here 1.5 millimeters. And then I will click uh okay or why aren't you let me select okay let's start again here so i'll select that profile 1.5 well that's interesting inside outside both i'll select inside why aren't you letting well if it's ever being weird you can always click cancel you can get out of things we'll try it again here i'll just select the shell command I'll select that face, I'll type in 1.5 and hit enter. Okay, it wouldn't let me click okay, but it did let me hit enter. And you can see I'm looking inside of it now. All right, it's been hollowed out. All right. Ah, this next thing is gonna, is gonna be a neat one. So that's step 27 and that says, from the inspect menu, select section analysis. Select the XZ plane as the section face. Click OK. This allows the inside to be viewed. Turn the analysis on and off whenever you wish with the analysis folder I in the browser. So let's just follow and see what that does there. So I go to inspect and I choose section analysis. And it says choose the XZ plane, which is this one in there. Except I can't click on it because it's inside that whistle. All right, so what I'm going to do is go over here and just click on the XZ plane from over here in the origin folder. And look at that. 
it cuts it in half. It's going to let us see what's going on inside of that. Right now, uh, I'm not going to change any of these numbers. If you really wanted to, it says section color. You could you could do a custom color. Uh, that that yellow is kind of nice. Uh, maybe I'll choose um, a, a, a red. Uh, you know, you can, you can kind of do whatever you want there. I'll click apply and click OK. All right, maybe I'll go with that red. And I'll just hit enter when I'm done. And then the other part said, you'll see there's a new folder over here. That's the analysis folder. Well, if I don't want to have the cutaway view, I can just turn that off and go back to my full object. Okay, we didn't actually really cut it in half. We just kind of uh, did an x-ray kind of operation on it. Okay, the uh, next steps, 28 says, add a sketch to the XZ plane. So let's go ahead and do that. So I'll click add a sketch, and then I'll just choose the XZ plane from over here in my origin browser. And so that XZ plane is actually runs right through the middle of the whistle. You can see that if I kind of tilt that over the side. So we're going to be drawing something kind of uh, maybe right in the middle of this whistle or on the spine of it, I guess. All right, number 29 says, add a line, snap one endpoint to the top wall edge of the whistle's top. Set the line's angle to 45 degrees. Snap the line's bottom endpoint to the bottom wall edge of the whistle's top. Well, that is gonna look like this. So I'm gonna kind of start over to the right of uh, my origin or my Y axis over here. I'm gonna uh, start a line, so that's L. And it says, place the top end point of that line along the top edge of the whistle's wall. So I, I know I'm on the top edge because it snapped blue, all right? And then I'm gonna drag out a little bit. It didn't say how long it should be, but it did say what angle it should be at. Right now you can see the angle is 48.5 degrees. I don't want that. So uh, the length is highlighted. It would let me type in, like if I typed in seven right now, it would create a seven millimeter line. We don't, we don't care about length. I'm gonna undo the length there. I'm gonna hit escape, okay? Uh, I care about the angle. So to get over to the angle where I can change it, I hit the tab key. See, if I hit tab, it switches between those two things. And it does tell me I need a 45 degree angle, so I'll type in 45. And now I cannot change the angle. Um, I'm going to unlock. Uh, I'm actually going to escape out of the whole thing. Start that again because I don't want the distance locked. So let's try that again. I will start at the top wall and then change the angle to 45. And I'm going to watch my cursor very carefully as it turns right there, it's went to blue. That means it's gonna snap on the bottom edge of the wall and boom. What we're doing is we're creating the, uh, the sound hole or the kind of sharp edge that the air passes over to create the whistle sound. All right, we got that done. Step 30 says, add another line. Snap one endpoint to the top wall edge of the whistle's top somewhere to the right of the line from step 29. Set the line's angle to 135 degrees. Uh, ooh, Snape, I'll change that to snap the line's bottom end point to the bottom wall edge of the whistle's top. All right, so create a line. That's L on my keyboard. My line tool's open. So start on the top edge of the wall and then go down. Now this time it wants me to have an angle of 135 degrees, um, which should look like that other angle. So. Uh, it, it's grabbing its angle from something strange here. Uh, what is it grabbing its angle from? It's 135 degrees. I don't know it's 135 degrees. This is not what it should look like, folks. In case you ever get into that spot where it, it's not looking like it should, you can always escape out of it, right? And try it again. So this time, there we go. That's looking more like the right angle, so or the correct angle. I should be careful saying right angle. I'll move to the angle with tab, and then I'll type in one, three, five. I'll hit enter, and uh, oh, well, oh, I hit enter. So that means that it, and now this is not the end of the world. I could delete it or start again, but I could also make sure that no tool is selected. So hit escape, right? 
Uh, I can also click on this endpoint and you can see, oh, there we go. The cursor turned to a black, uh, sorry, a blue cross. That means it's gonna snap to the bottom of that thing and that's where I want it to be. So boom, we'll just leave it like that. Okay, that's what you can do in case you miss the snap when you're drawing it in the first place. All right, and the next step, 31, says dimension the distance between the vertical uh, axis and the left line's top point to 10 millimeters. So this the green line right here is the vertical axis. And there's the top point of that line. So it says dimension it out. So basically, I'm going to force these two things to be 10 millimeters apart. So I'll hit D on my keyboard. And you can see there's a point where the top of the wall meets the axis. That's the point I want to click. And then I want to also click on the top point of this line. And you can see right now they're one point like five millimeters apart. It says change that to 10. Okay, and we did that. And then the next one says dimension the distance between the two lines bottom points to five millimeters. All right, well, this guy got away from us a little bit. He should be like the earlier direction says to the right of that line. So I, I'm just gonna click and drag this guy so it's to the right, okay? I'm gonna dimension it out with D. I'm gonna click the two bottom points as it says, and oh, I only got one, and there's the other. There's my dimension tool, and what does that want? Does that want five? Yep, yeah, it wants five, so I'll type in the number five, and then I'll hit enter, and voila. And then we kind of have this trapezoid profile here. I'm gonna escape out of my tool. Uh, You'll know that you did these operations correctly because when you hover your mouse over the trapezoid, it highlights the trapezoid. It is now a closed shape. So I'm going to click. I do believe that the instructions over here say click finish sketch. Uh, this is the outline of the whistle's top hole. Uh, so I'll go ahead and click finish sketch. And step 34 says use the extrude tool. Select the trapezoidal profile created in step 33 as the extrude profile. Set the direction to symmetric. Set the measurement to whole length. Set the distance to 17 millimeters. Make sure the operation is set to cut. Click OK. This cuts a hole from the top. So extrude is a neat uh, feature. It can create a solid object, but it can also create a cut. So we're basically going to use that profile to cut out a hole on the top. So I'm going to click on extrude. And the profile that I want, well, let's just say I have the wrong one. I, I can always hit that little X. Uh, and then it'll let me, if I click on it, select a profile. So I'll select on this profile right there. All right. And again, it wants me to do symmetric. And it wants me to do whole length and a distance of 17 millimeters. I'll just type in 17 for the distance. I need to make sure it's cut. It should be cut because it's a profile going through something that's already a solid object. So Fusion 360 is usually pretty good about uh, your context. Like, oh, you probably don't want to add a solid object in a place where that solid object already is. I bet that's supposed to be a cut. And then I'll just hit enter. And then you can, it's kind of hard to see with this material here, but if I kind of go to the side, you can see that that hole got cut out. All right. Uh, all right, now, number 35 says, use the push-pull modify tool. Select the face on the underside of the whistle's top nearest the sound hole on the cavity side of the whistle. Set the distance to 1.5 millimeters. Click OK. This positions the sharp edge of the hole, uh, I should say hole, sorry, directly in the airstream. Okay, so what that means is we're gonna click the push pull uh, modify button. That's this one right here. It's also in the modify menu. It has uh, a keyboard shortcut as well, that's Q. So I'll go ahead and use that. And that brings open the push pull menu. Now it wants me to make a selection. And our direction said, uh, select the underside of the top wall. So here's the top wall. Here's the underside of the top wall. Uh, and it said, select it on the cavity side close to the air hole. So that's this right here. And all I have to do is I think it wants me to offset this by 1.5 millimeters. So I type in 
and I hit enter. And you can see what that did is basically it thickened up that part of the wall so that this angle drops down a little bit more. So when the air passes over it, it will make a whistling noise. All right. And step 36 says, add a sketch to the XZ plane. Oh, we're going on a new plane now. So I'll go add a sketch and click the XZ plane. Okay. Oh, maybe not. Maybe we don't get a new plane. All right. So uh, we added it to the XZ plane. And 37 says, draw a true point rectangle on the sketch. So two point rectangle is this guy right here. Uh, there's also a keyboard shortcut for it, which is R, so I'll use that. And I'll just click once to set one corner and click to set the other corner. It doesn't much matter so much. And it says, step 38, dimension the rectangle to be 8 tall, 8 millimeters tall and 4 millimeters wide. So hopefully we're real familiar with the dimension tool, which is D on my keyboard. So I'll click this line. That's how tall it is. It should, says it should be 8. Eight tall I'll hit enter and it says it should be four wide I'll do that I'll type in four I'll hit enter so I have an eight by four rectangle right now okay step 39 says snap the upper right corner of the rectangle to the circles edge using the coincident constraint so here's the upper right corner that's basically going to live on this line so we're going to use the coincident constraint to do that so I'll, I'll, come on let me select that corner if I'm talented enough to do it, there it is. And we'll say, hey, you're going to live right there on that line. You can see it snaps it right there. If I were to escape out of the coincident tool, you could see I could drag this rectangle. That corner is always going to be on that line. And then step 40 says snap the lower right corner of the rectangle to the circle's edge using the coincident constraint. So now we're going to do the same thing with this corner. So here's my coincident. Select that corner. Select this line. Ooh, I didn't select the corner. Sorry. There we go. And you can see that all the lines of the rectangle turn black because it is locked into place with those two coincidences. Okay. Step 41. Add a tangent arc to the sketch. Ooh, that's a new one. Start the tangent arc on the upper left corner of the rectangle from step 37. End the tangent arc on the rectangle's bottom left corner. So I go over here. I go create. I go to arc and then tangent arc. All right, so what this wants me to do is just start in the upper left corner and you can tell that I'm snapped into place because of my blue box over my cursor. I will click to start it and I will just draw it right to this other corner and I know that I'm in the other corner because it snaps blue. All right, and you can see it kind of adds a half circle there. Uh, 42, add a center point circle to the sketch. Snap the circle's midpoint to the midpoint of the left edge of the rectangle. Snap the circle's edge to the upper left-hand corner of the rectangle. So we should know circle by now is C on the keyboard. You can see my cursor changes to the, the circle tool. It says to start this on the midpoint of the rectangle's left edge. Well, here's the rectangle's left edge. And watch my cursor. I know I'm on the left edge because I have a blue X. But as I get right here to this spot, oh, boom, it locks into place. Okay, so I am going to just click on that circle. I'm going to draw it out. Okay. And, oh, I forgot to say something. I'll add this back in the instructions here. This should be a 5 millimeter circle. So before I click the second point, I'm just going to type in the number 5 and hit Enter. And let's go add that to the instructions as well. Okay. Okay. Uh, because this is not quite true. I got that a little bit wrong. So what I'm going to say instead is uh, uh, dimension the circle to a diameter of 5 millimeters. Okay, there we go. And the next one says click finish sketch. This is the profile for the string holder. Oh, okay, so I'll click finish sketch. Uh, step 44 says use the extrude tool. Select the profile created in steps 36 through 43 as the extrude profile. Set the direction to symmetric. 
set the measurement to whole length set the distance to five millimeter make sure the operation is set to join click ok uh, i when i say select the profile i'm going to say this except for the circle okay so what we're going to do is we're, we're going to leave that circle blank we're going to extrude the outside and leave the circle not extruded that means it's going to be a hole that's what we're going to pass the string through for the whistle uh, all right so i'll use extrude which is e on the keyboard it brings open the extrude menu it wants me to select the profiles so i select everything but the circle so that's this piece and then this piece right down here the direction should be symmetric uh, the measurement should be whole and the distance should be five Right. I'm going to also make sure that the operation is set to join. I don't want a new uh, body. I don't want a new thing. I want this body to be part of the whistle. Okay, and then I'll hit enter. And you can see I have, I was going to think for a second. Or maybe it's just revolted against me. There we go. You can see I now have and of the string holder uh, extruded out. And if I turn off my analysis, you can see this whistle is really taking shape now. Okay, I'll go back to my edge view of this. All right. All right, so the next one says, open the fillet modify tool. Select the edge that joins the string holder to the whistle on the bottom side of the string holder. Set the distance to 5.8 millimeters. Set the tangency weight to 0 0.3. Click OK. All right, so the bottom, so when we 3D print this thing, the bottom's gonna be right here and the top will be right here. So this right here would be the bottom of the string holder. So it says open up the fillet menu which is, or the tool which is right here it's so it's and fillet what it does is it takes a sharp edge or a sharp corner and it rounds it out so we're going after this sharp corner right there on the bottom of the string holder so i'll click on that guy and uh it says uh, to do a few things so number one set the set the distance to 5.8 millimeters and then number two set the tangency weight to 0 0.3 and basically you can see that kind of ramps it up this i'm doing uh, mostly for 3d printing if i had a straight overhang like we used to have uh, it wouldn't 3D print very well. Uh, it might turn into a big plasticky mess right there. But right here, my 3D printer can do a better job of gradually printing up to this. There's a little bit of an overhang, but I think that's small enough that my 3D printer will ignore it. Okay. Uh, if I also turn off analysis, some people think that this might look funny, that the top edge doesn't have the fillet as well. Well, right here, you can add the fillet for the top edge if you want. It's not in the instructions. It's kind of an optional thing. I'm going to do it just because I like the way it, that it looks symmetrically. Uh, all I have to do is click Add uh, something to the fillet. And then I would go over here and I would click the, that same edge, but on the top now, and just give it the same settings. So this time... Uh, 5.8 and then you can see it does it on the top as well so when all is in place I'll click OK I'm going to turn analysis back on however okay uh, the next one says add a sketch to the floor of the whistles cavity the flat face that makes up the inside wall surface so if I look inside the cavity of the whistle that's this part right here what my cursor is on right now that's the floor of it so it wants me to add a sketch to that so i'm going to put a sketch there i can add sketches to planes we've add, added lots of sketches to planes this is our first time i think where we're going to add a sketch to the floor which is actually a little bit below the plane if i tilted that out a little bit you could see that the sketch is below the plane that we have been putting it on so far and we might be interrupted by my cat in a second here who's edging ever closer to this computer. All right, so I have uh, my sketch plane added to the floor. 
Okay. Number 47 says, add a line. Start the line on the origin. Ensure the line goes left and is constrained horizontally. Dimension the line to six millimeters. So I'll just go top here. I'm gonna zoom in a little bit here and line, we should know that by now is L on my keyboard. I will start it on the origin as the instructions say. I know I'm on the origin because my cursor turns blue. I'm gonna move it to the left and I know it's horizontal because I see the blue horizontal constraint and it wants it six millimeters. So I just type in the number six and hit enter. And there we go, it's horizontal at six millimeters. It starts at the origin. And number 48 says, add another line. Start the line on the origin. Ensure the line goes right and is constrained horizontally. Dimension the line to six millimeters. So I'm gonna do the same thing. I'm gonna hit L on my keyboard. Start on the origin. This time I move to the right. And uh, as I move to the right, uh, well, we can see um, that it's collinear, this is the constraint actually this time, which is okay. That means it's collinear to this line. So basically it means it's following the same path as the other line. Uh, so I'm gonna make this one six as well and hit enter and boom. So it's collinear to a horizontal line, which means that it is also horizontal. All right, uh, 49 says click finish sketch. This creates the line to draw the ball on. So I'll go ahead and click okay and finish sketch. All right, 50 says add a sketch to the X, Y plane. All right, well, we're on a different plane now. So I'm gonna click on uh, create sketch. I'm not going X, Z, what I've done a lot. I'm gonna go X, Y, which is this one up and down. All right. Uh, 51 says, add a line to the sketch. Start the line at the origin. Ensure the line goes up and is constrained vertically. Dimension the line to 12 millimeters, okay? I'm gonna actually turn off uh, my body here and my body is my solid 3D object, and the only one I have right now is the whistle body. So I'll just uh, go ahead and turn that off so I can see what I'm doing a little bit better. And it wants me to add a line that starts on the origin. And that should not say the origin. Uh, let's change those instructions real quick. Start the line at the uh point where the two lines from steps 47 through 48 meet okay ensure the line goes up and is constrained vertical dimension the line to 12 millimeters okay so i'm going to hit l for line so that's the point where those two lines, you can see those two lines that we just drew, they're right there. I'm gonna, uh, it wants me to start it at the point where they meet, which is uh, right there. Uh, it wants me to draw up. And I know I'm vertical because if I look down in the corner, I see a blue square. Okay, that's, uh, that means I'm at a 90 degrees. Since I'm uh, at a 90 degree angle to a horizontal line, I know that's vertical, right? I'm going to dimension it to 12 and hit enter. I have a 12 millimeter line there. Okay. Uh, okay. And uh, this next one says, add a center point circle to the sketch. Start the circle at the midpoint of the line from step 51. Snap the edge of the circle to the end points of the line. Click finish sketch. So right here, okay, I'm going to hit C for circle and I'm on my line right here. Okay, it says add it to the midpoint though. Okay, I am going to show you how to find the midpoint of the line. Uh, just coming back from a big edit here, apparently my two cats decided that they were gonna uh, start World War III, uh, so. If the audio sounds a little bit uh, like uh, like there was an interruption, that's well, that's because there was. All right. So to find the midpoint of this line where I'm going to start the circle, 
what I do is I just uh, hover over it and you will see uh, my blue snap cross uh, comes on. And then I'll just uh, move up, move up, move up, move up. And then right here, you will see a blue triangle. That blue triangle says you are at the midpoint of the line. So I'm gonna click there. That's where I'm gonna start my circle. And then I'm just gonna draw, uh, drag down until I get to the end point of uh, that line. And I can tell I'm at the end point because my blue snap box turns on. And I will just click enter and it creates a circle. There we go. And step 53 says, use the revolve tool, select one of the halves of the circle as the profile. Select the line that, uh, I should say that, splits the circle in half as the axis. Click OK. This makes the ball. So, oh, I need to click finish sketch here. And then I will use the revolve tool after it thinks for a second which is this one right here. I will select one of the two halves of the circle. I'll go ahead and select that one as the profile. Now, just like everything that revolves, it revolves around an axis, right? Like the earth revolves around its axis, tires revolve around an axle, right? So we need to select an axis. So I click on the axis selection. Now it wants a straight line as an axis. So that's the straight line that we just drew right in the middle of the circle. And you can see it gives us a preview of the ball itself and it should be right on the floor of our whistle. I will click OK. I'll go ahead and make sure to turn my body back on. I can now see a complete whistle. This is, this is complete. If you want to decorate it a little bit, you can. Uh, if you're in my class, I'll expect you to add your name to this, but we can cover that a little bit more easily in class uh, before you turn this in. But this whistle is loud. I've uh, managed to print one of these things and it has managed to annoy everybody in my house. As a matter of fact, I think it is now banned from this house. I'm in the basement making this video uh, out of complete fear and shame of my entire family if they found out I was passing this knowledge on to anyone else in the world. I think they would disown me. Well, folks, that's how to create a whistle. Uh, you can extract the STL and run it as a 3D printer. This was designed uh, to be optimized for 3D printing. That ball is on the floor of the whistle. So if you were to print it uh, with that, the ball side on the bottom, uh, you could add just a little tiny support uh, using your uh, slicer program. And that little tiny support would help that ball stay into place. And then you'll just take uh, a, a long metal object or a skinny metal object after it prints, put it through the bolt blow hole and just pop that ball out of place. And you have a fully functioning whistle uh, after you do that. I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, but more importantly, I hope you got to see some of the really neat features about uh, Fusion 360 and how you can use those for creating your own designs. All right. Have a great day. We'll see you around.